Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome RSA Conference Program Chair, Hugh Thompson. Hey everybody! One more time for DJ Shifty! All right. Wow. Shifty. Good afternoon. How was the conference? All right. Excellent. Well, welcome. Welcome to Friday of RSA Conference. I can't believe it's already Friday. And uh, I am actually quite impressed to see uh, you out here in the audience. There were some people in rough shape after that party last night. So I, this just speaks to the fortitude of our profession and the professionals within it. So re really appreciate you taking the time to join us. I, I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence during this session. And we've got some of the world's leading experts on different aspects of AI. And it's not just where does AI intersect with security, but what is the potential that it has to, to change how we work, how we live, maybe even things like geopolitical power around the world? What is AI going to do? And then I think another important piece is what are the limitations of AI? So amazing guests, they'll be out here in just a little while. Uh, but before we get started, I wanted to share a personal AI story with you. Now, for those of you that uh, have either worked in AI or spent some time looking at AI or have walked around the show floor and maybe sick of AI, um, you know that broadly you can categorize the, the kind of learning that goes into AI and machine learning into two types. One is supervised machine learning, and you can think about this where we actually curate the data set, we control the stuff that's fed into the system or the model, we know what's good, we know what's bad. And then unsupervised machine learning, where we have some stuff that we actually don't know what's good or bad, and you can find some emerging properties uh, of the system. And I, I want to share some personal information and news with you. Uh, we recently had baby number five, and I think we've got a picture uh, here. That's the smallest one. And, uh, you know, kind of at the, you know, at the two o'clock position. Um, and, and he's two weeks old. And I can tell you, there is nothing but unsupervised learning going on at our house, right? There's nothing supervised, there's nothing structured. And, and for those of you that, that have children or, or nieces or nephews or spend time around children, you know that they pick up very strange things from their environment. Like, how many folks here have seen a, a young kid go up to a television screen and just start to swipe it, right? It's just, it's just that, that's how they think about it now, right? They're, they're so exposed to iPads and, and, and those kinds of things. So we noticed a, a very unusual behavior in, in one of our two-year-old twins, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna share a video with you in a second, but w this behavior, let me talk about the stimulus to the behavior first, and then I'll, I'll kind of describe the behavior. So the stimulus is, if they're in the room with you, and anybody's speaking, and anyone says the word in any context, smell this behavior happens. So it's like, for example, if you said, wow, this dinner smells great, or is there a strange smell in this room, or what is that smell, for example, it will trigger this behavior. So just want to appropriately set it up. Uh, so my wife did a video of this, and it's highly repeatable, happens every time. Let's roll the video, I'll narrate it for you. So she immediately goes into her room, she pulls a pack of baby wipes down. She also carries a diaper, sets them down on the ground, also gathers diaper cream, puts it next to it, and prepares to be changed. 
So whenever she hears this thing, she assumes, and it must have happened so many times that it's her bad diaper that someone is smelling, right? And so uh, in reality, 30% of the time, she's, she's accurate. So I, I, I don't want to mislead you and say that that's, that's, that's never accurate. But we never taught her to do this. We never told her to do this. But she just learned this association by observation. And I'd say it's, it's an emergent property of just the way that we behave with her. When it comes to AI, we're starting to see many of those emergent properties happen in systems. Some of them are good, and some of them are quite dangerous. And we've, like I said, we've got some great experts that are gonna talk about this today. But first, I wanted to put to rest what I think has been a seminal question since the beginning, really, of the study of AI, which is how far have we come? Are we getting to the point soon where a machine, a system, can pass the Turing test. So I want to do you know, our own kind of Hugh Thompson show equivalent of such a thing. And to participate, uh, DJ Shifty, I'm going to ask you to serve essentially as a proxy for all of humanity. Are you up for this task, man? There's no pressure. There's no pressure. Assuming all of humanity wants me as their representative, I'm, I'm happy to do it. Let's go. Humanity? That's good enough for me, that's good enough for me. Statistically relevant sample uh, of humanity does agree that, that, that this is a valid uh, test with yours representing. So just to give you a little background uh, on G.J. Shifty, obviously incredibly talented DJ, as you've seen. And then I'd say, you know, typical DJ background, a degree in mathematics from Harvard, that kind of stuff. So that's, that's DJ Shifty. And then, we went out to see if we could get the very best AI in the market, right? So, you know, we, we, we looked around, we spent quite a bit of time, then we realized that we had a $100 budget. <laughs> and so we decided to go with a smart speaker. Now, many of you have a smart speaker in the home. There are several providers of such speakers today. We didn't want to bias this in any way, like, you know, just in case smart speaker lost, we didn't want to kind of get any brands upset or anything like that. So we have anonymized our smart speaker, and here it is. <laughs> Very much like a witness protection silhouette kind of thing. So we will be asking questions to DJ Shifty, we'll also be asking questions to the anonymous smart speaker. For argument's sake, we'll call it uh, uh, like Al Althea or something like that. And we will see who wins the most anticipated event, I think, in the history of this closing show. Shifty versus AI. Hit it. Okay. <laughs> this is how this is gonna play out. I'm gonna ask DJ Shifty a question. You will applaud. If you agree with his answer, don't feel peer pressured into doing it. If you, if you don't, dis, you know, if you disagree, definitely don't do it. And then I will ask our anonymous smart speaker a question. We put it through a voice synthesizer to, you know, to kind of shield the uh, guilty. And you can also applaud if such a thing has the correct answer in your opinion. Question one, Shifty, are you ready? Let's go. Okay. Question one, what is the height of Mount Everest? 29,029 feet, everyone knows that. Come on, let's go, let's go. Okay, all right. Of course, everyone knows that, Shifty. I, I definitely knew that beforehand. Okay, okay. So now, anonymous smart speaker, what is the height of Mount Everest? 29,029 feet. Okay, all right, all right. 
Both, both, both seem to agree, so we'll kind of call that one a tie first. Shifty, what is the value of pi? 3.14159, and I, I think that's all I have in this, yeah. Impressive, impressive. Anonymous smart speaker, what is the value of pi? The approximate value of pi is 3.14159265358979323846242. Yowzer, this goes on forever. All right, okay. Shift. Shifty, I'm sorry, I gotta give that one to the smart speaker. So we're, we're, we're at one zero here, given the first tie. Okay, Shifty. Can you pass the Turing test? I, I hope so. No, no one's ever told me I'm not a human. Uh, but I, have, I have a note from my doctor if you need some, some proof. No, I don't think we'll be needing that. Okay, thank you. Audience, just a reasonable, reasonable response, okay. Anonymous smart speaker, can you pass the Turing test? I don't need to pass that. I'm not pretending to be human. Okay, very honest. Very, a little bit of attitude, though, actually. Okay. Shifty, Shifty, I think I'm going to give this one to you, man. Yeah, then my very scientific analysis of the applause. Okay, Shifty, last question, P potentially a tiebreaker. What do... You okay? You good? Okay. What? Okay. What do you do? And keep it, keep it clean. What do you do for fun on a Saturday night? Well, first thing I'm going to do is crack open a bottle of wine, hit the couch, maybe turn on some Netflix, get that great British Bake Off going, and that is a party, my friend. That is a party. Either that or playing music somewhere around the world for fine folks like yourself. One and two. Netflix or rave. All right. Wow. Jeez. That definitely sounds better than my weekend. Okay, anonymous smart speaker. What do you do for fun on a Saturday night? I love to listen to music and work out elaborate dance routines in my head. Okay, all right, we'll accept that. Okay, in my official judgment, DJ Shifty, you take the prize, my friend. We are still safe. We are still safe from AI. So enough, uh, enough playing around uh, with the smart speaker. If you're interested, we can reveal the actual smart speaker later on. Come and see me. I've got a promo code. We'll get you sorted out. But now, now to some of the more serious elements uh, of AI. You know, one aspect that has been incredibly in intriguing to me is this subdomain of study of AI called adversarial machine learning. And this is a, a really an analysis of what happens to an AI system when you have an active adversary that's either tampering with the training set or tampering with the input that should be classified. And we are just incredibly thrilled to have one of the world's leading experts on this topic. I'd like to welcome out Dr. Don Song, professor at UC Berkeley. Hey, thanks for being here. Okay. What do you think? Did you agree with our DJ Shifty? That was an amazing match. Okay, okay, Shifty. Great man. job. And great job of the anonymous smart <laughs> okay, good, good. Okay, appropriately, appropriately anonymized. Well, Don, thanks so much for being here. You know, you, you have done such thought-provoking work in this area. In fact, some of your work just terrifies me, right? In, in, a, in a good way. And, and uh, thank you. So let, let me ask you, how would you describe adversarial machine learning? What, what is this? That's a very good question. So adversarial machine learning is about doing learning in the presence of attackers. So normally, for, let me just give uh, you an example. So when you look at computer vision image classification, normally the computer vision system, you feed it a natural image, for example, and then we'll try to label, recognize the objects in size, and so on. But however, remember, that's what we are doing here. We are talking about security. And when we talk about security, we are talking about attackers. 
So when you have a computer vision system, an attacker actually doesn't have to feed it a normal natural image. It actually can perturb the image, and it can perturb the image in an arbitrary way that it wants. So for example, it can perturb the image even very, very slightly in such a way that for humans, we can almost not tell the difference. But however, attackers can generate these adversarial perturbations and then try to use this to fool the computer vision system. Don, I don't, I don't think anybody would ever do that. That's, that just sounds paranoid to me. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> okay. But I, you know, if, if you look at many of those AI systems in production now, there's the autonomous vehicles, for example, mm -hmm. that are looking at images, lots of images, and then making choices based on those images. Mm -hmm. There are obviously things like social networking sites that are classifying images, trying to tag images. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, a video of some very, very interesting work that you've done in this space, particularly with autonomous vehicles. Set this video up for us. What, what are we going to see, and what was your thinking behind it? OK, great. So you'll see in the video, actually, there are two frames side by side. On your right-hand side, uh, right, so, so both are two, uh, there are two frames. On your right-hand side, you are going to see when the car drives by. At the bottom, you'll see the, the image uh, recognition system will give a prediction label. So there is a stop sign at the far end when the car is driving towards the stop sign. The recognition label will say what the computer vision system thinks what the traffic sign is. And then on the left hand side, you'll see an almost identical setup. The only difference is that at the far end, the traffic sign is an adversarially modified traffic sign. And I love that adversarially modified traffic sign. That sounds like something you have to say in front of a judge at some point, maybe. I don't know. But yeah, no, this is great. And then at the bottom, you'll you can try to see the difference between the prediction labels from the computer vision system. OK, great. Let's, let's bring up the video and, and take a look. So on the left, we've got the unmodified stop sign. On the right, we've got the modified sign. At the bottom, the one on the right is saying that, yes, it recognizes this thing as a stop sign, right? And this, we should stop. But it looks like on the left, it's happy to continue 45 miles per hour. And I love how you just happen to set this experiment up on the edge of some kind of like massive drop off lake. Right? That was unintended. You didn't have to do that, but that's, that's, I like that. I like that. I really do like that. So, but, but let me ask you, know, just kind of pausing here. Geez, if I looked at those two stop signs, or, or, or my two-year-old right, looked at those two stop signs, she'd say that one's a stop sign and that one's a stop sign. They both look like stop signs. It's not like you shaved off the side and repainted it. Tell me, tell me about the kinds of modifications you did to the one on the left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good question. So for the modification here, essentially, we developed a new algorithm, a mathematical method, and essentially is trying to solve an optimization problem to figure out what perturbation the attacker should calculate and should uh, in inject such that it can make the attack successful. And also the problem is actually quite challenging, in particular in this setting. So number one, we want to make sure that the adversarial example, in this case, is actually a physical object. Mm -hmm. So we want the attack to be successful even in such a physical setting. And also, as you may have seen, as the car continues to drive towards the traffic sign here, essentially for the computer vision system, the viewing distance has been changing and the viewing angles has been changing. And in this case, we need the attack to remain effective, to be successful throughout this driving process. And hence, the attack actually has to be crafted in a very uh, intelligent and smart way such that the attack can remain successful even in these varying conditions. That's incredible. So even at a, at a far distance away, this sign becomes effectively invisible and Very remains smart. invisible even when you get really close to it, to that system, because of these changes that you made to it. Right, so we want the attack to be successful even when it's viewed very close up as well as when it's viewed, for example, much further out. 
And I, geez, I, 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 I'm such a huge fan of your research because this is such a consequential problem, right? I mean, we see autonomous vehicles being talked about all the time. You know, there's some uh, other work related to yours uh, that I'd love to, to show, which is still on the image recognition problem. Uh, and this one, uh, this work was done over at Carnegie Mellon University, I want to say maybe about a year ago, uh, by Mahmoud Sharif, for those of you who, who know him, I know Don does, a very, very talented PhD student there, a few of his colleagues at CMU, and some folks from the University of North Carolina. And they sat out on a slightly different problem. Their question was, can I take a facial recognition engine, and in this case, I think they used one from Oxford, an open source engine that a lot of folks have been experimenting with, trained on 2,600 images of celebrities, and could they deceive this engine to make one person look like another person? And they decided to use glasses as the means of deception. And I want to roll this video. Uh, well, first, let's, let's go to the pictures. Let's go to the pictures that it trained it with. So this experiment, uh, which got recreated uh, by Dr. Saurabh Shintre, uh, who's a colleague of mine, and he's on the top. And you know, several pictures. The one in the middle looks like a little kid, actually. I got to kind of um, you know, ask him how old he was in that one. Uh, but three pictures from him on the top, and then three pictures from me on the bottom that Sorob got from, uh, from the web somewhere. And if he's out there, thank you very much for choosing ones with hair. I you know, really, really appreciate that. Um, and so that system got exposed to both of these training sets. And then let's take a look at what happens when you actually run this experiment. So let's look at the video, and we see Saurabh, and we see the system. If you look at the top left, you see it is identifying him correctly as Saurabh. He now puts these glasses on, they look kind of stylish, and you see on the top left, it now thinks that he is Hugh Thompson. And you'll see in a second, when he takes him off, he's back to Saurabh, according to the system. And there's some numbers there that indicate how confident that system is that it really is Sorb or that it really is me. And you'll see there's a high degree of confidence in both cases. And in fact, you know, he loaned me these glasses. So if anybody's interested afterwards, again, you know, I can hook you up at a reasonable price. Uh, but these things were printed with a 3D printer uh, for the frames and the sides. But the actual surface, the facade, got printed by essentially a, a home laser jet printer. So let, let, let me ask you about this, Don. I mean, this, it feels like, and you're the expert, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm asking this as, as somebody who has a background in mathematics, my PhD's in, in, in statistics, not AI, but it feels like there's a lot about AI and machine learning that we don't yet fully understand. Is that, is that a fair statement? That's or? absolutely true. Even though we've made a, uh, so much progress in deep learning, AI, and so on, but it's, it's still an uh, active, open question. Like why deep learning systems, uh, why they work, how they work, and there are many, many open questions that we don't understand. And that's why we are studying adversarial machine learning as well, is to also help us to understand better their limitations and how we can defend against these attacks. Well, this is great. Amazing, amazing work. Please give me a heads up if you do anything on like a plane or something like that. But thank you so much for being here and thanks so much for the great work. Right. Thank you, Don. That was great. <laughs>encourage you to read some of Don's papers are just just mind-blowing in this area they uh, they will really terrify you so next uh, our next guest has a different view on AI so she has studied what are the relationship aspects of AI like for example what happens if AI comes in the form factor of a robot that looks like a human 
How do we feel about that? What, what kind of emotions do we have towards it? What kind of ethics should be applied? And I think this is one very, very important element of humanity that we need to consider as more and more AI gets adopted. So I'd like to welcome onto the stage Dr. Kate Darling, who's a researcher at MIT Media Labs. Kate? Hey, Kate. Hey. How are you? Welcome. Hey. Welcome. Wow. Jeez. OK. This is your robot replacement. I knew someone would bring that up. OK, all right. Kate, good to see you. Good thanks, to see you. Thanks for coming. And uh, yeah, thanks for bringing your friend. Mr. Yeah. Spaghetti is Mr. Here. Spaghetti, OK. Why, can, I, can I touch oh, you? Oh, please. Yes, he likes one. being touched. All right. Let's see. There's is touch sensors. Mm, if you put your finger in its mouth, maybe. OK, OK. Well, yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's a reasonable. Wow, so tell me about this guy. So this is one of my favorite robots. It's a Pleo. It's basically a toy. Um, they were made, I think, in 2007, and I'm not sure if they even still make them. Uh, but what I really love about it is that it mimics life really, really well. Um, and the design is just brilliant. Like, instead of trying to be like a cat or a dog or something that you would immediately kind of compare it to and be like, oh, that's not quite right, it's a baby Camarasaurus. Which, I don't know, Hugh, have you interacted with a baby Camarasaurus before? Not to my recollection. Yeah, no, so, yeah, so it's like really easy to suspend your disbelief and treat it like a living thing. Wow, and it's, got, it's making these little like cooing sounds. and Yeah, that is very interesting. And so let me, let me ask about that. I mean, as we get more into AI coming in the form factors of things that we grow emotionally attached to. What are the implications of that? I mean, and not, not that this is a, is a you know, personal therapy session, but I'll, I'll tell you, I'm having a problem with it, with Siri on my phone. Not, not personally, not me personally getting attached to Siri, but my five-year-old is like in love with Siri. He actually tells her, he's like, I love you. And if you tell Siri that, she says like supportive things like, I love you to the moon and back, or you're the back. And so there's like this relationship, even though she can't see, so I'm really concerned about that. We'd probably talk about that offline. But <laughs> what, what are the implications of people assigning human or dinosaur attributes to these devices now? I think there are quite a few implications, but first of all, you know, I think we're, we're really entering into an era of human-robot interaction right now. Like artificial intelligence, robots, these technologies are creeping into people's lives in ways that we haven't seen previously. And people are interacting with the technologies. And the thing that I think is really, really fascinating about it is that we're primed by science fiction and pop culture to want to treat these technologies like they're agents, like they're alive, and like they have personalities. And I, I would say we're even biologically hardwired when it's like a physical thing that's moving in our physical space to want to assign agency to it and intent and, and, and so forth. So, you know, people are suckers for these, these types of design. And I think as more and more you know, creators of this technology catch on to that and start designing interfaces where people interact with the technology, I think we're going to be able to uh, get people to engage um, even better. Uh, and you know, whether that's a good or a bad thing depends on how we end up using it. Well, what are, what are the things that you think would surprise our audience around kind of the attachments that people are creating? Or like, uh, you know, I think about how I interact with systems that may, may not be AI, they may just be kind of like rich rule sets now, but support, like online support. When I have a chat box, it's like, you know, Fred would like to chat with you. And I'm like, hey, Fred, how's it going? Oh, hello, how was your day? Everything right? And I'm like, you're not Fred. <laughs> this isn't Fred. And, but, you know, then sometimes maybe I think it is a person because they're, they seem kind of compassionate. But other times, like, how is this going to change just our view of interacting with systems? Well, first of all, I think we need to get the design right. Because you know, there's 
Clippy that interacts with you that is Clippy. super annoying. No, I love Clippy. <laughs> Are you kidding me? That thing could turn into like a store. It'll like help write your document if you're. This, is this the only person in the world who loves Clippy? Yeah. Like. <laughs> Thank you for your support, audience. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for. Okay, okay. so clearly, yes, clearly we need to yes, tailor but... the design to individuals. Okay. But there's, <laughs> there are things that most people find annoying, and things that most people find more endearing. Like, I mean, you you were talking about the Turing test before. Um, this chatbot passed the Turing test uh, by fooling human judges into thinking that. It was human. This was a few years ago. But the way that it did it was really interesting because it was the design that set expectations in the right way. So it was pretending to be a 13-year-old boy from the Ukraine. And so your expectations for the English and the understanding were very different than they would have been if you had you know, huh. thought of it as an adult interacting with you who's, who spoke that language or the same language as you. So that's interesting by, like, and you mentioned it almost when you brought Mr. Mr. Spaghetti, Lazon, Mr. Spaghetti uh, out, uh, out here that because I don't have a concept of what this dinosaur, or some, some kind of dinosaur you mentioned, whatever this thing is, that I won't naturally compare it to something else that I've had like that, as opposed to if it was a cat, for example. Yeah. I could start to make comparison. That's not a cat, and that's not acting like a cat. And, but you're saying we need to think about representations of AI systems in ways that may be human, but look a little bit different than we do. So people expect that there's some of these properties, but not all the properties. Yeah, well, I, actually, it's my pet peeve that we're constantly comparing AI and robots to humans. And to even you know, trying to design them to replicate human ability, replicate human intelligence, that's not where the true promise of this technology lies. And people don't like interacting with it when it's trying to be human, because clearly it's not up to snuff. But these technologies have a lot of skills that we don't have. And I think mm. if we compare this to like our history of domesticating animals, using animals for work and weaponry and companionship, and we try and think about AI and robotics that way, then we can design for these supplemental uses where they're actually enhancing our skills and being partners in what we're trying to achieve rather than just replacing humans. Now, is there, what happens as we continue to progress in this field and we develop systems that, you know, are, are reasonably intelligent, that people really do get attached to or dependent on, do those systems ever have rights? Are there ethical issues to kind of think about when you're deciding, hey, well, I'm just going to kind of take the batteries out of this thing, or I'm going to terminate? <laughs> is, there, is there an element of that that has been explored at all, or are we light years away from something like that? Um, well, I, I mean, first of all, people already do have attachments to their robots. I mean, I know you have a Roomba at home. I do. I don't know how you feel about the Roomba. If you I feel really the same like way it. as you feel about Clippy. It's clean stuff. I have a lot of kids. I feel very strongly about my Roomba. Yeah, but people, I mean, the Roomba is a fairly simple robot. It, it doesn't really know who you are or distinguish between hey, you and hey, a chick. Hey, 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 hey. Easy on the Roomba, okay? <laughs> this is like... This. This is not, not your average Okay, your, Roomba, your Roomba okay. loves you. Okay, okay, all right. But people love the Roomba. I mean, people name the Roomba, people feel bad for the Roomba when it gets stuck somewhere, and you know, that's, so it's just a disc that moves around, right? So as we get better and better design. Okay, okay, let's move off You really, off you the really Roomba. like your Roomba. Off the Roomba. <laughs> I scared, you know, there's so many examples you could have picked. Okay. <laughs> but, but like, okay, so, so the empathy, the empathy that we have for these machines already is just going to get worse as the design improves. And so one of the things that I've done in the past, this wasn't, this wasn't an experiment. This was a workshop. But we took five of these robot dinosaurs. And if you want to, it's asleep right now, but um, hold it up by the tail. Does it bite? Does it bite when you do that? No. Whoa. Yeah, oh man. It's like 
So it's I, like it's in pain. Yeah, does, how does that make you feel? Does that feel weird at all? Yeah, I, you actually feel like guilty. Guilty for doing it. That's, I mean, that's, yeah, that's actually. A, oh, so geez, yeah, we, so we did a, a workshop where we had people torture and kill the, the dinosaur robots. And it was very upsetting to people. And from that, we, uh, we ended up doing a bunch of experimental work on empathy and violence towards robots. And um, we found a correlation between people's natural tendencies for empathy and their willingness to harm a robot, even though they're perfectly aware that it's just a machine. So I do wonder how, when we interact with these systems, whether on a subconscious level, you know, there might be right and wrong ways to treat the machines, even though they don't feel anything, um, uh. and whether a uh, you know, a future vision of robot rights might come out of that kind of how do how should we be treating these systems? Ah, who knew Isaac Asimov would be uh, so ahead of his time? Yeah, well, this is this is fantastic. I mean, this adds uh, a really interesting dimension, at least that I don't spend very much time thinking about. But as these things enter our lives, it really is something that we have to consider. Because right? I can imagine us making at some point good or bad decisions based on how we ascribe these properties to, to these systems and devices. Absolutely. Okay, and I'm glad somebody's studying this. Thank you very much. <laughs> and Thank thanks you. for introducing us to Mr. Spaghetti. Thanks. Yeah, no, thanks. Really appreciate it. Thanks. thanks. If she knew my Roomba, she would not be saying those things. I'm just, okay, I just want to clarify. So, you know, I think we've talked about some of the emergent properties of AI. We've talked at some of the sub boundaries, if you will, uh, of AI. Now I want to talk about the possibilities. Right? You know, those of us that are in this field, we are used to thinking about worst case scenario. That's what makes us very good at what we do. That's what also makes us very depressing at a party, right? But, but it, is, it is important to understand what the limitations are of technology so that we can help that technology succeed and thrive. My next guest is just an absolutely impactful force in this area. He is the founder and president of Udacity. I don't know if anyone here has taken one of the courses or gotten one of the nano degrees from Udacity, but absolutely fantastic resource online. He's the CEO of Kitty Hawk, and he was the founder of Google X that did some of the very, very early work uh, in autonomous vehicles. So excited to have Dr. Sebastian Thrun. <laughs> Sebastian, how are you, man? Have a seat, have a seat. Thank you, thank you. Hey, it's my twin, it's my twin. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good to you. have you, thanks for coming. I want to say this, thank you for the work you're doing and thanks everyone in the audience for the work you're doing. It's so incredibly important. I could not do my work without you. Thank you, Sebastian, around for this, for this audience. And you know, speaking about great work, what you guys have done at Udacity, I think, is fantastic. I mean, it really is opening up educational possibilities for people in ways that at least I haven't seen before. And in fact, you know, RSA Conference was so thrilled by the work that you're doing. I am happy to announce that we are donating fifty thousand dollars in scholarships for your new cybersecurity nano degree that you're just launching. <laughs> no, we've been so, so blessed. Um, Udacity's mission is um, to double the world's GDP through making education available everywhere. Most of us students don't pay a dime. Uh, we are very big in the Middle East where we try to teach young Arab people how to code. We are in China, India, Brazil, many other places. And we've been fortunate to team with top-notch companies like Google and Facebook and pretty much everybody 
um, in the tech space to build these curricula. Um, at this point, actually, if anyone in the audience uh, wants to be a part-time instructor and teach millions of people and take your DNA into the world, um, send an email to thrun at udacity.com. And we also are you look for recruiting? Companies. Are you recruiting? We are. Yes. Here at <laughs> okay. Okay. I just want to be clear. It's, 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 fine. it's an amazing be... experience to go over any app in the world and people recognize you. All right. Well, thanks. Yeah, I encourage everybody to check that out. And uh, Sebastian, you have had a pretty incredible career. It's like it's like taking a normal, amazing career and then running like a compression algorithm over it. And that's your career. Don't, don't believe what the media says. OK, it's, it's, well, I, I read I on Wikipedia. PR, yeah. I read on Wikipedia, yeah, so I know it, it's true. It. But no, but honestly, <laughs> you know, if you, you, you did some of the very, very early work in autonomous vehicles, AI that powers those vehicles, you know, you're continuing to kind of push the ball ahead in this space. But I'd say the thing that I love about what you've done is you have such an inherent optimism about the future of AI, right? Because a lot of these discussions that I get into with you know, my fellow security professionals when we're talking about AI, it's like, I'll, I'll tell you a dramatic reenactment. It goes, AI, 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 Skynet. And then, <laughs> and then that's the end of the conversation. I mean, that's a summary, but that's, you know, it's like, <laughs> Concerned I'm glad about your it. conversations are short. They're short. Well, oh, I'm just, God, you know, just for the days. interest of time of this session, I just really tried to get <laughs> distill it. But, but tell me, how how do you think that the widespread use of AI will change society? So I'm incredibly excited, and to express my excitement, I want to take you on a mental journey, something like about 300 years ago, roughly when the the steam engine was invented, back in the day your equivalent self would have worked in the field as a farmer in all likelihood. And your definition of who you are was tied to your physical strength and agility. But we never built an automated farmer. We then built force amplifiers, machines that let a person supply food from four people to about 400 people. And as a result, today we have less than 2% of the population working in farming. Now, what happened to us? Most of us moved into offices and with a stupid, mind-numbing work over and over and over again, okay? So truck driver is obviously one, which I've worked on in Google. Or well, taxi driver is the same task uh, day in and out. But even highly paid jobs, like medical doctors and lawyers, end up doing the same stuff over and over and over again. We had a study recently at Stanford where we looked into skin cancer, trained deep learning to detect skin cancer based on about with 129,000 images, we were able to be on par or better than the best dermatologists in this country. And those guys were paid, these guys and girls were paid $450,000 on average a year. So I find it degrading for humanity that we have data entry clerks, accountants, uh, lawyers that do uh, document discovery or contract drafting. These are great things the first time you do it, but don't spend your entire life doing it. That's why I'm optimistic. I think we now have AI that can look over the shoulder of anybody who does work and pick up the patterns and then take over more and more of this work so it frees us up to do much cooler things. Now, now let, me, let me just take a step back and unpack what you just said because <laughs> you, you, you listed a lot of professions in there, right? Anybody right here from, a lawyer? <laughs> that will Sorry. admit it in an <laughs> open group. No, okay, no, we like Doctor. lawyers. Some of my best Parents. friends know people that are lawyers. You're safe, don't worry. The, you're special. But, but you know, I mean, but you, 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 you went through a, a whole bunch of professions. Some of those professions considered incredibly highly skilled. Like you're talking about a dermatologist, somebody that spent probably a good chunk of their life in school. And I know you're optimistic on AI, but it, what it would maybe feel like to me if I was one of those people is like, geez, I'm going to get replaced by AI. Oh, and right, I've right, actually right. had this thought myself, to be, no, wait, to be so uh, kind of completely first, honest. It, so if that's your concern, be a farmer. OK, go to Africa, where 75% of the working population is still in farming today. Okay. We'll spend a week there. And I then realize, consider that. And realize when we all farmed, we didn't invent much stuff. Like, we had no running water 300 years ago. We, uh, we, we didn't have water toilets 300 years ago. So everything was stinky. 
right? We had no electricity. We had no penicillin. We, all these things we take for granted today, all the way to cars and, and planes and cell phones that we're all entitled to, right, didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And why does it exist today? Because when, when the first machines were invented, they, they made us into superhumans. All of a sudden, I could plow of 10 times as many fields, 120 fields. And then all of a sudden, I could run across or swim across the Atlantic in like 10 hours. And then I all of a sudden could talk to a person in Australia with my regular voice. A, a total superhuman. So I think the big thing now is the, the brain prosthesis that, that takes our brain, outsources it, and helps us get rid of all the work we don't want to do. That's interesting. So, so basically, you're saying we shouldn't think about ourselves becoming obsolete or replaced, but it sounds like what you're saying is this is going to free up humanity from the mundane things that we do or the repetitive things that we do to be able to do something else. What is that something else, you think? So historically, I always, when I look at these things, I always go back to the past, and, and maybe it's my subjective interpretation, how I want the past to look like as a non-historian, but, but I look at this and, 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 and ask myself, um, what are, are people good at and what we are bad at? And as we free that human brain power away from farming and maybe warfare and childbirth, what the people did at the time, uh, more into um, writing, reading, childhood, education, and then science, uh, data, um, we were able to unleash enormous creativity. We were able to invent like amazing stuff. And I believe that every human being is creative. And you can do the test tonight. Get yourself a bottle of wine with a friend. Spend the first 50 minutes saying nothing. And then come up with crazy ideas. And then resist this twitch to say that makes no sense. And to say, this is kind of cool. Like, why don't we invent a gravity shield? Like, like here's, a, here's a good one. So why, why don't when cars don't fly? Um, why don't people still die of cancer? Um, there's a whole bunch of, of things you could invent um, that if you just think about and have the time. And then add to this technology, not just AI, any technology. What if? What if you could build a Google in a day, right? So suppose we have this beer idea 10 years ago sitting here and saying, hey, I think we should make all the world's information retrievable. And you'd say, sure, let me come back tomorrow morning, it's done, right? Um, that's where we're going to. Like WhatsApp and it sold to Facebook had, what, 50 people, like 50 people on its staff, and they had over a billion users. And that's kind of amazing. And AI is one of these technologies. I think um, Signal Out is like, it's a bad name. It's like this human thing with emotions and so on. That's not what I think about. I think it was turning us people, us, any one of you, into an unbelievable superhuman. You know, I, I think about the kinds of folks that, that I deal with. And, you know, we had to take the kids to the hospital, to the doctor. And you, know, you deal with, um, with a nurse, for example, who's so empathetic. Right? There is an empathy that she expresses appropriately to the child, to the parents. She comforts us. I mean, of course, she has medical skills and she applies those skills. But there is something so human about that. And I can only imagine a time when she could devote even more of her time to that. Or, or a teacher, or a teacher who always feels so overworked because more students get crammed into yeah. her class, but you want someone like that to have the best of their humanity expressed yeah. to that child. And, and you, I think you're hitting the nail on the head here. I think there's a whole bunch of things we just don't want machines to take over. I don't think I want to put my folks into an aging facility just handled by robots, sorry. I don't want my son to be taught by robots. I, I was in the hospital this morning because my son had some severe burns. And yes, oh, you're right, man, the, sorry. The, the nurse had an amazing empathy and it calmed him down. Um, but then if you look, for example, at schooling, right? We have so many people that are data entry clerks. They sit in front of a screen at a scanned PDF and then type this data over into an Excel spreadsheet. That's their life. I just summarize an entire job you can do for 50 years. And, and, and I'd rather have these people be teachers. Why, why do we have a, a teacher to student ratio of one to 30 if we all know that one to five works much better? So I think there's many jobs for us to take, right? Like when you go to the doctor, why is there a wait room? Right? Why doesn't a doctor wait for you? <laughs> I like that. I'll suggest <laughs> that to him. Credit to Jeff Bezos. That to him. Credit to like, Jeff what? Bezos, what's not my idea? <laughs> So where, where do you think, you know, if you then took out the crystal ball, right? Crystal balls always are, are, are uh, sometimes a little bit unreliable, but if you took a crystal ball out and said, 50 years from now, what would be 
the most important skill set? Is it is it things like artistry and you know social skills and uniquely human things? Like what 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 will be those skills? Today, those skill sets are very analytical. It feels like those are the ones that get yeah. rewarded heavily in society. What are the ones that you think will get rewarded heavily? It's about about three. I mean. My son is 10 years old and goes to school, and the teacher tells him you have to be good in math. And I say, no, you don't. You can always hire someone who's good in math. It's fine. Um, <laughs> I would be the guy that gets hired. <laughs> it's not good. Um, okay. Let's see, uh -oh. what are the, the skills that I think is important for everyone, not just kids, but everybody in the audience, I think, going forward, because we move so fast. I'd say it's um, curiosity. It's often called mm. a growth mindset, uh, the willingness to, um, to do something and realize it was wrong and learn from it. That already sets, I think, Silicon Valley apart from huge numbers of other people. Uh, grit, I think, is really important. Don't give up, or don't give up fast. Um, and I'd say, I think, um, people skills, uh, social emotional skills of being able to deal with us is actually increasingly important. And that's something where traditional educational institutions tend not to educate, they tend to great people individually and on their, on their hard skills, but not on their soft skills. And when we, Udacity works with employers, uh, like many of you, uh, we hear more and more often it's so important to work in a team with other people and find that consensus and, and drive things forward as a team, not as an individual. Well, let me ask you one more question about that. You know, you, you mentioned growth mindset and I've had the opportunity to spend a lot of time with Carol Dweck, who did you know, a great body of work around that. and then. We had Angela Duckworth as a guest several Angela, years ago who did the uh, pioneering work on grit. But I, and I think about those attributes, and one of the big questions just in my conversations with them is, are those teachable or are those innate things that we were born with? But it sounds like, it sounds like what, you think that these are things that we can actually teach and mature and nurture and grow in people if we actually spent the time to do it. Yeah, I mean, this is a bit above my pay grade. I'm not a learning psychologist, but I would hope that everything is, is teachable and learnable. And I would hope every one of us has aspects of it and moments where we are really good at it and then moments where we completely fail. Um, I always tell my friends when we ask, like, what is special about Silicon Valley? And I mean, you're all part of it, right? And I tell my friends in Germany, I tell people we are both incredibly arrogant and incredibly humble. I think when I say I want to double the world's GDP with my little startup company, that's a bit arrogant, right? And I actually believe it. I believe education is the one thing that always doubled the world's GDP historically. Um, maybe not just me, maybe some other companies as well. Uh, but then at the same time, I can't move in and say I have all the solutions, right? And, and I have met a lot of in entrepreneurs who believe they have all the solutions. Some of them are incredibly smart and they have all the solutions, but more likely than not, one of them is wrong or two. And if you don't recognize what's wrong, they're gonna get stuck. And I've seen a lot of companies get stuck because the leadership wasn't willing to admit that they might have gotten something wrong and didn't do the, the pivot at the right time. And that's something I think that's being, the DNA, I don't know if it's taught here or if it's in the air, maybe it's the water in San Francisco with all the medication, uh, but somehow all of us, <laughs> all of us <laughs> seem to have that. And I love this so much about Silicon Valley. I love this, and I love being here and loving working with companies here, as we do a lot with Udacity, uh, to, to bestow that kind of thinking on the entire world. I just recently received an email from a person in Saudi Arabia who's taking Udacity classes, and all of a sudden was a lady who was able to get a job as a software engineer remotely for a company in Australia. And, and just think that we can take us and duplicate us and taking what we have learned here and what's special about this place and bring it to everybody in the world so everybody we can just be like us is incredibly powerful to me. Well, Sebastian, thank you so much for, you. for your voice, the work that you've done. And thank you for inviting to what me. what comes next. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> take care. Uh, folks, please, one more round of applause for all of our guests. This fantastic, <laughs> brilliant, brilliant people that, that are working on something, I think, so important for all of us. I just wanted to take a, a couple of minutes here at the end and first just say thank you. Uh, RSA conference for me is, is always a time of reflection and a time to, to recharge, right? To, uh, be even more excited about what we can all do together. 
And I wanted to thank you for the conversations, for the interaction, just for the energy that you brought to this conference. I think, you know, there's a lot of relationships that get formed here that end up lasting forever. And I really, really appreciate that. You know, on this topic of AI, other topics will come up over time. And I think it is our responsibility as security professionals, as people in the profession of security, to truly understand how these new technologies, new approaches, new ways of looking at the world, how can they fail? And then we want to be on the preemptive side of that, understand how these things can fail, but be the biggest advocates of driving them forward. And I think specifically, we, specifically with AI, we have an opportunity to unlock some of the best of us going forward. It doesn't have to be Skynet. I think we can unlock the time that we all want to spend with each other. Things like empathy, things like compassion. So this is a, a very personal topic for me, a very human one, and one that we can really make a difference if we are the flashlight and the guardians of the future. So thank you so much for being at RSA Conference. Can't thank you enough, and look forward to seeing you next year. Have a safe flight home. Thanks very much.